welcome everyone to this third podcast in our series from the Port Arthur Seafarer Center on merit, the maritime industry during National Maritime Day week. Uh, on Friday, we'll be celebrating National Maritime Day, which actually began with uh, President Franklin Roosevelt. And, but today, Wednesday, we're going to be focusing on women in on the waterfront and women working in the maritime industry. And so with me is again is Doreen Bado, who is the Secretary General of the Apostleship of the Sea USA. And she's a member of WISTA, which is the Women in the Shipping and Transportation Association. I am a WISTA sister. And so with us also is Captain uh, uh, Augusta Roth, also, aka Gussie, and also Aaron Barrett, who is with us from the uh, uh, Marine Engineers Beneficiary Association. So thank you guys for being with us today. As we begin this podcast, like we've said the, the previous days, we want to think in a very special way, the Port of Port Arthur, for being the sponsor of picking up the tab on running these podcasts. And also we want to thank in a very special way the different associations that have joined their names to this program and we'll be reaching out to their members in order to encourage them to watch and be part of it, make comments. Especially want to thank the Nautical Institute uh, Houston Gulf Branch, the Council of American Master Mariners, not only the uh, Texas A&M Gal Maritime Academy in Galveston's chapter, but also the Houston chapter. We have the Propeller Club of Sabine and Natchez Ports. We have Wright Ships, as well as the Apostleship of the Sea Diocese of Beaumont, and also the Apostleship of the Sea United States of America, the Port Arthur International Seafarer Center, and also the West Gulf Maritime Association. All these folks have said, hey, we want to support you. We'll reach out to our members to encourage them to participate in that also. So let me just start with you, Gussie, because we were, I was privileged to sail with you uh, last year. You were teaching me how to shoot stars and do celestial navigation, which was something that I had always wanted to do. I had the opportunity of sailing on the uh, Golden Bear for a month with the Texas A&M uh, graduates last summer. And so, uh, Gussie, who are you? Where did you come from? How did you get into this thing? So um, many years ago, I, I grew up in Central Texas where there was beautiful clear water in the rivers and fell in love with water. So once I moved into figuring out what I wanted to do with my life, traveling was main on my list, um, working with my hands, getting out and not sitting behind a desk was a really big, big drive for what I wanted to do. And uh, back in the, the time that I was going, we had what we called a prep program and you could go aboard a ship and study some histories, English, some basic classes. And it opened my eyes to a world that I never would have known about because of the, of the landlocked area I was in. And um, so that, that next following year, I, I started up with the maritime transportation degree in A&M Galveston. Um, it's one of the, the few select areas that we have maritime academies in. There's a couple of them up on the East Coast, Maine, Mass, New York, of course, the Federal Academy, Kings Point. And then there's one up in Great Lakes Maritime Academy up in Michigan, one over in California and in Texas. So we are the South Regional Texas Maritime Academy and um, very unique in what we do. I studied working on deck, handling cargo, navigation, as you said, celestial by land, electronics and uh, various different travels while we're there because we go out every summer for three summers during the degree plan and uh, get to practice hands-on experience and then traveling the world. So that's how I got into it was just by chance. Uh, there's definitely not enough advertisement and opportunities that we have. The deck side is definitely more hands-on and I'm glad you got Erin as my counterpart here. Uh, she'll tell you all about how we keep our uh, hotel services and engines going here in a little bit. But the deck side is definitely more I can't say paperwork anymore because it's hitting both sides with the regulatory stuff, but there's a lot of organization and business portions to it on the deck side too, the HR management kind of stuff. And then after that, when I graduated, I did lightering offshore, which is ship to ship transfer on tankers, um, and then did a lot of small OSV offshore supply vessel type work, um, delivering fenders and lube oils to various places, and then decided to come ashore and and teach students what I have learned since I love the, the field so much and uh, still get to do hands-on and not get stuck behind a desk. So that's kind of how I got into the space I'm in now. 
So Aaron, how, how about you? And, and uh, so Gussie comes from a, a tech department part and you came up through the engineering side. So what's the engineering side? How'd you get involved in this? Uh, so like Gussie, I <laughs> didn't have a big introduction to it. I was landlocked in central Texas as well and uh, had an older brother and sister who were still living at home and I wanted to run away. So uh, <laughs> my mother found the academy for me, Texas Maritime Academy, um, and she knew I wanted to go to a smaller campus. So I attended uh, there, did the tour, got there, and uh, one of the, uh, on the old Texas Clipper, the original Texas Clipper, there was a sign going into the engine room that said, those who can do, those who cannot become deckies, <laughs> so I changed from a marine <laughs> engineering deck license option uh, uh, choice to a marine engineering uh, and then a, a license option choice at the academy and worked my way through there. So um, a great choice for me. I like to fix things. I like to get my hands and figure out how things work. Um, and um, while I did miss the sky, uh, I still could go outside and look at that when I wasn't actually working. It was never, you were, you never had a day in which you were cold at work. I can I tell you, not. Jackie, standing <laughs> manifold watch, I never, you never got cold. <laughs> not even on a snowy day. <laughs> so how, who did you sail for once you got your degree and, and where did you do on, what kind of ships did you work on? So uh, for myself, um, when I graduated, uh, I did a favor for the chief engineer at the academy and I sailed as a third um, on the training ship first. Um, this was right during um, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, no, Gulf, first Gulf War 91. So it was a phone call from the uh, MEBA union looking for every engineer that was graduating. And um, I had already given my word to the school. So I did tell them I'd see them in August. So they, they saw me in August um, and I came up here to uh, the Houston office at MEBA and went to work. Uh, my first job was that day I got a job when I came in to ask a question. So uh, I went off, I've worked on tankers, uh, bulk ships um, and uh, tar carriers. So it's been a variety. I've worked on steam, gas turbine and motor propulsion vessels. So that's a wonderful opportunity that the union has allowed me. Well, that's that's really neat. Now, when you were when you're going through school at that time, certainly the guys would have been the regular way guys are. I'm trying to keep my language clean. But <laughs> how did other women respond to you guys moving into that industry? My biggest encouragement to go into engineering. Uh, was my sweet mate. She was the only other female in the industry, um, in the program that was doing marine engineering. Um, and by my second year, I was the only engineer in our program. We flunked everybody out. <laughs> License option with the Coast Guard. So there were other marine engineering uh, degree persons, but um, for the license option that I was, I was the remaining the one man standing. All right. I guess we have you as far as uh, sisters, cousins, friends, classmates saying what? Uh, a lot of them were fascinated by it. They, they didn't realize there was that opportunity to get out there. Um, many of my friends were a couple of years already ahead of me. So they had already chosen some careers and were on their path to going there. Uh, over the years, many looked back and kind of thought, man, if we would have known there was other ideas of ways to get engaged with employment as opposed to the traditionals, they would have explored even just the business side of the maritime, oil and gas. There's a lot of people don't really even understand how to get into some of those niches because they're not broadcasted. The, you know, they, they talk about you know, lawyers, doctors, but then they don't get down to the specifics. And then when you get into the degree plans, you can pick. For us, it's, it's completely different. You have to pick a campus that knows about maritime if you want to be in a waterborne type of, of degree. Um, otherwise, you don't have those expertise just lying around. There's a shortage of maritime expertise, too. 
uh, to the in-depth ability to advise and train and educate and carry those positions. So for me, once the women saw me doing it, they, they were very intrigued. Um, but of course, a lot of them were already set in their path and their direction to go. So that was unfortunate. Um, some of them would have really liked to do it. I know a lot of my friends that were getting into stuff would have loved to have done it this in the end. Uh, the stability's there, the travel's there, the alternatives, even to keep a family, you know, you know, Aaron yeah. and I have family. So it's 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 doable. It's just yeah. you have to think outside the box on some of your opportunities because the more you move up in even a, a major corporation, you travel a lot too. So it's 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 things that once you get to know it, you kind of realize, hey, there was a, a better chance of me surviving being gone that many months out of the year. Thank you for saying that because that's one of the reasons we're really excited that you are here today. Uh, this week, since we're, we can't do our normal Maritime Memorial, we thought we would do some a virtual celebration of what's going on in our industry. And we really did want to put that spotlight on the women on the water because there are so many people who just have no idea that the maritime industry exists. Right here in Port Arthur, we're called Port, right? Port Arthur. And there's so many of our, our schools our counselors, they have no idea mm -hmm. that they should be telling uh, children anything about maritime careers. But if they do have an idea, we're afraid that they don't even know that there are wonderful careers for women in the maritime industry. So we're really excited to have y'all here today. And I just think it's really funny that both of you found how to get into the maritime world, though you were <laughs> from landlocked cities. And here we, we are in Port Arthur and people don't know how to get there. So thank you for being here today because we, this, is, this is an important conversation. And I share with people all the time that in 1996, the 1976, when I graduated from high school, they had the prep program on the old rudder and you could join for that summer and ride on that ship and collect time as well as take basic courses that you take everywhere. And I didn't even know that University of uh, Texas A&M Galveston existed in Galveston, 80 miles away from where I am. God I would, didn't want you to know. We <laughs> ate at Guido's, you know, we drove down, <laughs> saw the, you know, went by the flagship, all these different things that we saw in Galveston and didn't even know that it was there. And I, I it, it's, it's been paradigmatic in my life of the opportunities that were there and to do that type of work and to get that degree and people are just absolutely unaware of it. Some of our old mariners, I think probably most of them have passed, were very engaged in the 1960s of establishing the Texas Maritime Academy and yet it, it just doesn't happen. Now we used to have doorways to employment so you could walk half a mile from where we're sitting right now to the National Maritime Union Hall on 7th Street. And if you were a high school kid or, or a uh, uh, college student, you could go in there, throw in for a job for summer or sailing as a wiper or sailing as a, as a steward's assistant or maybe a, a deckhand. But those have all sort of closed up. We had, MEVA had an office here in Port Arthur until about yeah. 15 years ago. Uh, uh, Master Mates and Pilots had an office over by what was the Port Arthur Club, which is now the Port Arthur Health Facility. They had an office there. So there were doorways that if you were interested in getting into the maritime industry, you could find the doorways. But all those things have left. And though we are a major port that has hundreds of maritime jobs, we have most, many of our U.S. flag like tug jobs are being filled with people outside the area or people from Louisiana, especially Edson Schwetz down there at uh, Chenier, because people aren't even aware that this opportunity is here. I wasn't. Uh, like I said, it was my mother who found uh, the academy for me, and it's because she worked as an undergraduate library at UT and had met one of the English professors while he did research. So, I mean, it, it, it was an odd way to get down to the academy, but I got there. Mm -hmm. So, so Gussie, uh, you know, you mentioned that earlier. How do we, how do we break out of this thing? Because it's not just how do we recruit more women in the maritime industry? Because, you know, we 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 certainly see that that the industry of nursing is dominated by women, with some men in it, and 
the maritime industry is probably going to continue to be male dominated with some women in it. But what is clear is that whether you're a man or a woman, it's hard to find where the door handle is in order to enter into the industry. I, I've struggled with that. I, I've tried to do several things for recruiting and it's it's like I said before with my friends, they were kind of already set in the path way earlier than just seeing their high school counselor, what opportunities are out there. At that point, if you're looking for a job, you, you really have no idea what you want to do. Um, and or maybe you just have so many ideas of what you want, you can't narrow it down to a field. But there's there's a there's a time period, it seems that to be more impactful to talk to, to younger people. And it, to me, it's beginning to be middle school or maybe even junior high as they want to expand out and then try to target those classes as they go through and apply what they learn. So I was really good at physics and math and I loved it. And, and if I could have gone back or maybe I even still will, I may find a way to get an engineering degree, but it's something that taking things apart and tinkering, I love to do it. I got to do that a lot on the deck back when I started because there was a lot more interaction on the ship for the deck officers to take things apart and then call the engineers and say, hey, I got an extra part, where did it come from? Um, I got to do some things and, and it was a lot more fun, but I never really got to see the engineering side of it until later once I had already picked a, a path. So if people can start directing the younger students on the knowledge and, and ideas of what they like to do, they could maybe get into those niches where they see this stuff, like designing a ship. It's very much mathematical. It's very much science. The, the teachers need to bring those in and show that those are opportunities to see how the works and forces of science work. And it's just not being done. They stick to the, the basics and, and the very remedial, straightforward kinds of traditional teaching as opposed to bringing in those niches. And, and I, if that could happen, I think it would open a lot more doors. We see the nurses when we're kids, you know, we, we see the doctors. Hopefully we don't see too many lawyers, but we hear about how well they do for people. So it, you don't hear about the mariners that transport all of the goods basically around the world. I mean, very small percentage is basically less than 10% doesn't touch a ship somehow or another. So nobody talks about that supply chain on the way up as they get to their high school. So marketing in that aspect, trying to get it out there earlier on may help them drive towards it. And uh, Aaron, it, it does, does uh, MEBA have any programs? I, I, I think you guys used to have a program at Calhoun at your training school in Mar near Annapolis, Maryland, where uh, somebody could go in without going through the academy as an, and become an engineer. Is there any way without going to one of the academies that one can actually become a maritime engineer? Uh, not through uh, MEBA anymore. That program stopped many years ago, but the uh, starting in the industry, you do not have to have a license. You don't have to have a degree. Um, called the hoss pipe. You know, you start at the bottom and you work way up. Um, that is still on the job training and on the way there. Uh, we have our um, unlicensed union who helps people do that. This uh, Seafarers International Union, SIU. Um, here, that's here on, on this coast. Over there on the west coast, they have SUP. Um, so there are the unlicensed unions that do still help get people started to be able to get their documentations. And you don't have to go to an academy. There is um, schools similar to San Jacinto Maritime Academy who gets people started in it. They are getting their 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 basic education and at a above high school level that also gets them the training and the documentations that they need to be able to get out on that water. So I, I get my third engineer's license. And uh, and so I want to I want who is MEBA and how would I join you guys? So MEBA is uh, stands for Marine Engineers Beneficial Association. So we are a union of licensed officers for U.S. flag vessels, and we have both deck and engine officers. So uh, even if you had that third mate, you can come see us. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
<laughs> well, well, you say that we actually had we had the St. Louis, the car carrier St. Louis. They had that little fire problem, uh, so they came and in. they came here at the port of Port Arthur, and then yeah. we entertained them for a while. And the the cap, I sent mass on board that on the car carrier, and blessed the vessel before she left, uh, so she wouldn't catch fire again. And so far, she hasn't. But uh, the, but the captain has shared with me that they were they were MEBA top to bottom. Yes, and so we we do represent uh, officers um, deck and engine, and then to join the union um, is a matter of, of putting in an application. Our books are open because uh, shipping is a cyclical nature, uh, comes and goes, but you always need us. Um, and right now, you know, people retire, people get out of it. It's not what they really think it was, uh, because if you do know somebody who's a mariner. You probably heard all those fun stories and see how much time off they have, but you don't actually see them on the ship working their butts off. That's right. um, <laughs> the 12 hours a day, six days a week. Seven. Um, no, seven, yeah. I usually, I usually don't work. I don't work overtime on Sunday. That's but you, but you, that's still an eight-hour day for you. Yeah, you? Day. you know, that's that's overtime. It's not your regular work day. There's no time off when you're on the ship for that. You know. Uh, three to six or currently longer for some people uh, during COVID-19 but um, that time period it's an every day all day small environment uh, not necessarily uh, you know I remember going from a nice warm port called Hawaii up to a very cold port called Alaska in a matter of three days and so your 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 body is constantly um, under stress, both from environmental and from work uh, conditions. And so once people get out there, it's not always for them. And so it's, you do have a, a turnover. And so uh, our books uh, remain open for taking applications and for putting people out to work. And the variety of ships through our union, uh, small to large, ocean going to Jones Act. So uh, it's, it does give you also variety to see what you like to do. And and Gussie, we've when I was on the Golden Bear with with your cadets last summer, which was just a wonderful experience for me. Really enjoyed working with them. Uh, but the predominant group was deckies. It was like there were 75, 80 deckies, and there were seven engineers. Uh, what's that all about? Where does that come from? So. There is a lot more glorious portrayal of the deck side than there is of the engine side. Um, you get to see people out there doing the celestial with the sextant, and then you see the engineers down there in their grease and their coveralls. It doesn't seem to be something that everybody would like to do. And like Erin said, everybody gets sturdy and everybody works hard. Um, unfortunately, in the, in the Texas program, we are definitely heavier on the deck side. Um, that is because of the wide range of positions which are more apparent to the public, which would be pilots that bring the ships in and out of the port. And then, of course, the deck people that you see on board the ship, they're like, well, how do I get to do that? And they talk about the deck people. They don't necessarily always portray the engine people, forgetting that there's the whole ship would not go anywhere. Yes, Aaron, I know. <laughs> <With that. laughs> it's always a joke between the deck and the engine. You need your you need your propulsion you need your rudder you need running water you have to have air conditioning so there's there's certain things there that those people provide in the engineering spaces that are transferable just as much to the shore side if you did decide that it wasn't for you and i don't think that's advertised as much as it is for the deck you know we go into the deck and then we end up being maritime lawyers or we end up being deck officers we end up being in the office engineers can do the exact same thing they also could go into facilities i mean they they, they have an enormous array of abilities to maintain facilities because that's what we are is one massive floating facility out there and we work together to make it all happen and i don't think and aaron you can correct me if i'm wrong that that's even marketed to the general yeah. public as much temperature also has something to do with it uh because yeah. The, the cruises and uh, are typically during the summer. The engine room is hot. Um, and if you look at some of the other academies, uh, they have more engineers because they're in a colder 
area. And so weather does have something to do with it, but also that education opportunity and that uh, informational opportunity to let people know what is possible after school, after this education, after this learning, what can I do? What do I do with my degree? Everybody asks that question in college. What do I do, do with my degree? And for some people it's, it's, well, if this doesn't work out, you can go this way or this way. Um, and for engineering, it's what can you do a lot, what deck officers do a lot, and you can still end up behind a desk. You say that because actually as a, as a decky, uh, <laughs> as an AV, that, that the opportunities that we have are somewhat limited. Even Yes, you can go up the chain and you can be a port captain and you can do become a, train to be a lawyer and do admiralty type of thing. But direct transference of work mm -hmm. from the tech department to the land is not there, but it clearly is there for the engineers. They can go and run mm -hmm. the plant at a host at a major hospital. They can run a large gener electrical generating facility because the, uh, of having their license brings them into contact with all the things that they would be working in mm -hmm. in, a, in a major uh, energy generating facility it's just it would be even bigger than the ship itself and there's a there's a much better transference going on between direct job to a land-based job in the engine room which i must reluctantly acknowledge then then on the decky side because we have to take our experience and add something to it to go into these other other fields unless we're just going to go from the from the bridge to maritime management say you know for MERSC or somebody like that but uh, so what, what I want to finish up with uh, and see this has been almost painless hasn't it that uh, <laughs> it's hard to believe that 30 minutes of your life have now been lost that will never come back again but what I want to finish up with is asking both of you and, and Doreen you can jump into this too is what's the one message or the, the message you would like to send out especially to women about the maritime industry you can do it. Shipping mm -hmm. is fun. How many of these cliches can I say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's not for everybody, but it is a rewarding. Um, I, the time off, and that applies to everybody, the time off. Once you're done with the, the ship, you walk, you go, and you enjoy your family and time. So your quality of life at home is unbelievably focused and it's but it does take an independence and a strong woman to do it so i picture rosie the riveter every time somebody says what do i want to tell somebody else you can do it let me skip the camera you can do it right? <laughs> um you can do that and uh it, it's possible and uh, whether you're deck or engine the water is mesmerizing and you say that because the 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 need for Swedish steam power has declined even on the deck, and now with the Samson ropes that you that we have to work with on the deck, which I mean they were the old old hawsers were just incredibly heavy, and now the Samson stuff is so light, so easy, hydraulics on the deck. Uh, the physical, even even uh, for the men, the physical need, the need for brute physical strength on the ship is not there. We're not; these are not sailing ships anymore. And between hydraulics and and uh, chain lifts and different things like that, and come alongs, uh, we're not lifting 300 pounds and moving it from point A to point B anymore. Not without a team and equipment. Yeah, That's with right. equipment, <laughs> smarter, not harder. <laughs> uh, Gussie, say, final word for you. I, I would say, I mean, if, if you're a woman looking for something adventurous and, ex, and you like to explore and you're bold and, and you try new things and you just have that tenacity and that fun to get out there and, and try new things, every day is different offshore. It's, it's, it's like Aaron was saying, each port is different. I mean, you may go to the same one 
over and over again, but each time it's different. You have a new crew, nothing gets boring. Everything is, if you keep it lighthearted and you like to work, don't don't hesitate. You, you can do it. I mean, there's going to be obstacles in any job that you take, and there's going to be things that you do like and not like, but you balance them. And for me, knowing that there was a new day that's going to start over each day and it's going to be totally different was exciting. It was fun. It was never boring. So if you are if you're wanting to, to go out and, and, and get something done and you have that personality, this is a task that you can you can definitely do. It's 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 amazing. And I can also say you're going to make a heck of a lot more money than you do as a priest. <laughs> you, you a this, you know, four years instead of eight. But but Jesse, so one of your graduates leaves and goes goes works deep sea uh, as a third mate. What's the wage level there? Um, and, and as Aaron said, there's a long periods that you are out to sea, and, and there's some short periods of time ashore. Um, a little bit on the rotations it's, it's usually a one for one with an unlimited license and then sometimes you get into the limited license areas where you would have two days of work to one one day off so you have ratios of two months on two months off for maybe two months off on and then one month off and if you work for a union you could kind of break it up a little bit more but just don't ever expect not to have a long haul um so once they graduate and, and they do they, they're still getting jobs even in lulls um they may not just be as the glamorous, high-paying jobs, but sixty to eighty thousand is a safe starting salary for us when we graduate. The you know, the average college graduate is making more around the thirty to forty. So it's it's a quite a bit different. Um, there are bonuses. There are ships that can pay way more if you add in more certificates and you get into niche specific jobs where there's not as many people. The, the competition's down. They pay more. So dynamic positioning, um, Aaron may have some over there on the engine side that are, they're still opening up, I guess, LG, L, well, LG. L and L and L and yeah, they're coming in. So those will be paying more because they need those specialties. So you could get up to almost 90, 95,000 a year. Yeah. And, and Aaron, for you guys too, in the engine room. So you do, I just graduated from Texas A&M with my third engineer's license once they finally open up and allow me to test again. Uh, what, 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 what does an MEBA green third mate, a third engineer come uh, type of wage level he runs into or she runs into? Similar to what uh, Gossie just said, 60 to 80,000 is an easy uh, idea for their salary for a beginning year. Yep, um, and, that, and that's about, that would be between, between six months of work and what eight months of work for that for that which is which is beats the heck out of uh selling shoes and working at cheddars so uh yes, yes. <laughs> especially if, yeah, in, 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 in the union you're also looking at not just that's your take-home pay you're not that you also have all the other benefits that come with being part of a union and part of a union benefits that's your health the the uh access to training that doesn't come out of your own pocket, your medical, your pension. So all of these are wrapped up in uh, in your job, what you've got coming. So it's not just the salary you see in your pocket, but it is the additional benefits that uh, are provided. So, so when you add all the bennies in, into that thing, you're looking at a, 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 a total yeah. package of something more than 90 to 100 or more, even or this college graduate who has who has college debt, but he or yeah. she can then uh, find some income in order to take care of that debt in a in a reasonable manner. So. And it's never too early to start thinking about retirement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> For me, seven years, baby, seven years. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Yeah, well, then, I'm plan on the, it. And then I'm going to be on the new. Oh, 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 Gussie. We were supposed to talk about it. The new training ship. New training ship. New training ship. So we, all of us are on a mission to get new training ships for all the academies. Texas has been in a dire need for a larger ship uh, for quite some time. And uh, we're hoping that everybody will keep writing congressmen and pushing because this is a national requirement that, that we get this ship and that they would provide it. Um, so Marad, 
is one of the, the key players to, to talk to the congressman and letting them know what we need for the style. And, and that's been designed now. And they've actually started working on the first two. And we keep pushing that all of us will get one. So definitely reach out to your congressman. This is where the people are being trained, not only for us to drive the vessels in and out of the port, get your port security from that, but we also support the military. Once we go into any kind of status where we need to pull mariners to drive ship, we, we step two. So that's an option too that we can have in our pocket if we ever need it. So yeah, definitely need training ships and, and they, they bring more opportunities to the students. We'll get our prep program back and, and get more people at least knowing the idea that there is a maritime industry in our nation. In fact, we wouldn't survive without it. And if we're going to post that to the Port Arthur yes. Seafair Center's Facebook site. Yes, and we will put it out through our e-news. We'll put it on the AOS USA site and out through their e-news and then also the uh, AOS Diocese of Beaumont Facebook site. So we, we, we will be doing our part to help spread the word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So that, yes, that, that would be really great. And we'll punch it out there. And when people watch this, uh, as they're watching this, they'll be able to go to either the Port Arthur Seafair Center, a Apostleship of the Sea Diocese, Beaumont, places like that, where they'll have the information on where to send so that they can add their name to the letter being prepared, I think, by you guys over at Texas A&M so that that will go there. Make it even easier so they don't even have to write the letter. They can just send their names and then put that there. And we do have a lot of Sea Aggies in our area, so I know that we'll have a nice response from a lot of people who care. But thank you guys very much for being with us for this uh, podcast and uh, uh, hope if we get any information, we'll certainly send them to you of other, other women who may be interested in careers in the maritime industry. Thanks so much. God bless. And as I said, we want to thank in a very special way the uh, Port of Port Arthur for being the sponsor of this, also the Nautical Institute of, Gal of, the, of Houston Gulf Branch. Uh, the Council of American Master Mariners, uh, Propeller Club of Sabine and uh, Natchez River, as well as Wright Ships, the Apostleship of the Sea Diocese of Beaumont, Apostleship of the Sea USA, as well as West, West Gulf Maritime Association and the Port Arthur Sea Fair Center. So thank you for being with us on this uh, third podcast. On Wednesday. On Wednesday, because it's Women on the Waterfront Wednesday. So thanks for being with us. God bless. Thank you.